This is Fast and Fearless with Zach Brown and Brendan P. Keegan. Accelerating leadership as they share their stories of leading United Auto Sports, McLaren Racing, and Merchant's Fleet at 150 miles per hour. My name is Brendan Keegan, and I'm here with my friend Zach Brown. Zach, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. How are you doing? Great. Really looking forward to talking about leadership, talking about gaining a competitive edge, and kind of talking to our audience about accelerating their careers and their professional lives. Absolutely. Something I think you and I uh, try and work on every day. Some days we get it right, some days we don't, but you learn a lot from those days you don't. Yeah. I kind of go back, Zach, to when we we met. It was at the um, F1 Austin race, and I think we were kind of... uh, comparing leadership notes and we were talking about passion and energy and, and vision for companies. And, you know, to think about it, that was just a year and a half ago when we kind of got introduced to each other with our partnership through Extreme E. You've always been a uh, high energy and uh, led by example. I, uh, I try and do the same. I think we're uh, fortunate in that we, uh, we love what we do. So I don't think, uh, well, I don't want to speak for you, but speaking for myself, it never feels like uh, work to me, even though some days are, are tough. Uh, as the great Nicky Lauda once said, he learned a lot more from losing than he did winning. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you know, one, um, one, one question that I get asked, you know, here at Merchants, you know, when we did the partnership and people know that we've kind of become friends, they've said, you know, you know, Brendan, uh, we've really gotten through this Netflix series, Drive to Survive, a really good insight into Formula One. We get to know McLaren Racing and this guy, Zach Brown, he's big personality on it. And I always get asked, like, what is he like? Like, who is Zach Brown? What, what's, what's the leader Zach Brown like? So I'd be interested in throwing that question instead of me answering it on your behalf. I'd, I'd be interested in throwing that question at you. Who's Zach Brown, you know, as a leader in a company and who is he off the track? Um, pretty much what I'm off the track is the same as on the track. It's, um, I don't know if that's a strength or a a weakness, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've obviously a motor racing, uh, aficionado dating back to my, uh, my early days and, and my passion for the sport has only, uh, grown, uh, over time, having once, uh, raced and owned teams and CEO McLaren. And, um, so passion drives me a, a ton. Um, I'm only passionate about things I, I love. Um, you know, where I struggled and probably why I struggled in school is if there's a topic I'm not interested in, it's pretty hard to get me interested in it. But if there's a topic that I love, uh, I won't put the book down, so to, so to speak. So, uh, I'm definitely lead with passion and, and, you know, I've tried over the years to make sure, um, emotion didn't creep into that passion. I always tell everyone, I think passion's a, a great place for business. I think emotion uh, sometimes uh, can get the best of you and you make some uh, poor decisions or emotional decisions. So I try and find that fine line between passion and emotion because I think some people see those as maybe kind of one in the one in the same and, um, and try and be an expert at what you do. So I feel very confident in my knowledge around motorsports and uh, there's not a lot of other topics on Jeopardy that I think I would get uh, – I would get right. And uh, I don't know. I think, you you know, it's always amazed me the energy that you have and and your your passion for sharing leadership. And, and, you know, from what I've seen with you around your people, you try and turn everyone into a leader and have an organization filled with leaders. And when you look at your different values, how does that cut across how you lead your business and, and your life? Yeah. So I, you know, values, they're, they're so core to who you are as a person um, first. And then, you know, second as, as a leader, um, you know, and, and a couple of mine that, that I rely on personally every day is, you know, strength, courage, faith. Uh, matter of fact, you know, one of my sign offs all the time and, and I'm in my office right now and I'm looking at the wall and it's written right on the wall, you know, have the courage to fail and the faith to succeed. And that, you know, if, if you're trying to do something great, uh, you got to have the courage to fail. And, and I just think of your sport, you know, there's 20 people that start the grid and 19 don't win, you know, so, you know, one person wins or so 19 people know at the end of this race, or maybe 17, cause there's, there's three on the podium, but you know, 17 people know, Hey, I'm not going to win today. 
and but having the the courage and, and you know when I watch the race, you know, I'm amazed at the courage they have to go that speed. That's a whole other conversation. But you know, values I think are what keep you centered. Uh, um, they they keep you who you are. Um, but more importantly, if you honor your values on a daily basis and you're authentic, I think you're much more approachable. Um, you're much more relatable. And I think as a leader, uh, and as you go up your leadership uh, journey, and you maybe go from managing two people to five to 10, to a function, maybe to a company someday, not losing that approachability, not re- not losing that relatability is really important because you want people to come in and talk to you. You want them to bring challenges that the business has in early, not late. You know, hey, if we know there's a challenge on lap one, you probably got a chance at winning. If you know it's on the last lap, you know, not, not a lot you could do. Um, but I wanted to go back to a comment you made and tell a little, tell a, a, a probably a negative story about myself that became positive. Uh, you talked about emotional, so emotional intelligence, EQ. You know, I, I talk about EQ a lot because uh, I was in my first uh, company I worked with, uh, company EDS, Electronic Data Systems, Ross Perot founded it, 120,000 people. Uh, the company got me an executive coach, put me through some type of 360 assessment. And they actually said this to me and, and they didn't say McLaren. They said, you know, Brendan, like, you know, you're like a Ferrari around a race car or a racetrack on your performance. And I'm like, well, these guys think I'm pretty special. This is really good. That was the 28 <laughs> year old in me until they said, but your EQ is pretty low. You know, there is a break in the car. Everything is not gas, gas, gas. You can't push people the way you do and, and get to where you want to go. And I, and obviously I still remember it, but it was, it was really enlightening having somebody give you a compliment, but then really kind of strip you down and say, until you work on your EQ, it doesn't matter on getting to where you want to go in your goals until people really emotionally attach to you. And you have more self-awareness, meaning me have more self-awareness that, you know, it's gas break, it's gas break. It's not just all gas. And, you know, as, as a, as you said, as a high energy guy, and, and, and you know, I, I look at you around the world, what you're doing, and I think I have high energy, you got way more energy, that it's very easy to get in the mode of all gas. So, you know, I, I appreciate uh, the EQ comment. And I can tell you, from probably 28 to now, I'm, I'm 53. It's the number one thing I work on is that emotional intelligence, you know, sometimes to read the room and not say a word, you know, that's the right yeah, it's, it's, decision. It, go ahead. It's funny. I mean, I've, I've got a similar story and uh, something that I've worked on, right? Not everyone uh, has the same work ethic. Not everyone has the same, you know, skin in the game. Uh, some people it's, it's just a job um, and everyone has different priorities. And I remember once in my old company that I, I sold some time ago, I, uh, I sat, sent out a company wide email. It's about 250 people on a Saturday night at, 10 o'clock, I would have been thinking about business. And I sent what I thought was a harmless note. Hey, who's thinking about business right now? Like company wide, you know, 10 o'clock on a Saturday. And the amount of feedback I got on how destructive that was, like on the Monday, some people responded right away. Others didn't get the note. So they were done doing their Saturday night thing, one in the morning, and then they thought, should I respond? It's one in the morning. What's he going to think if I respond to one in the morning? And, and it really kind of messed with everyone's head. Should they respond right away? Should they not? If they saw it late at night, should they not respond? Because it was why, you know, and it was like, I was actually just kind of joking. And um, so that's kind of an example of what you mentioned of just being full throttle and not necessarily having an appreciation that not everybody else is going to roll like you do. And that's not uh, a bad thing. I always used to kind of view it in my early days as well. If you're not 24 seven like me, then you're not being productive. And that's not the case. Every got to kind of respect everyone's ways of working and when they're turned on and when they turn off. And I've gone much more to a results based um, uh, review of how people are doing, not kind of how hard you're working, but how smart you're working. Obviously the two go, uh, hand in hand, if you can work hard and smart, then you're going to have a leg up on the competition. Yeah. So interesting, you know, you, you, you're talking about that. And, uh, 
I, I can imagine that feedback you've got. I, um, I, I, I get the positive and negative feedback from, you know, I, the term I use is unintended consequences. You know, I meant no harm, but, you know, did something come across the wrong way? When you talk about, you know, working smart and, and work ethic and you talk about the environment we're in now is very different than the environment three years ago. Now, granted, if someone's a race mechanic, they can't exactly do that remote. But, um, you know, ha- have you seen, you know, post COVID and during COVID, like, have you seen differences in your workplace and your work environment as a result of, of, um, of the, of the pandemic? Yeah, quite a bit. And what's interesting is how it's starting to kind of come back to, I guess the old, old normal, I think, you know, we responded really well, I think the world responded really well to kind of hybrid working and, and having to work from, from home. And then, you know, it took a little bit of time to get people to come back to the, the factory, the office. Cause I think they, you know, people it can be a creature of habit, but what you do lack is that, um, you know, bumping into people in the hallways, those impromptu meetings. And what I'm seeing is people are starting to miss that. So we, like everybody else, I'm sure you're the same kind of embrace hybrid working and treat everyone as an adult and kind of generally have a, just get your job done where you get it done from um, is less important, but I'm starting to see that that employees are coming to the conclusion themselves that they want the human interaction uh, beyond, uh, you know, just being on a, on a WebEx call. Um, and, and that's, that's nice to see. Cause I think, I feel more productive being around everyone, but I think, you know, coming back to trying to make a work environment, a place where people want to be, I don't think you can force people back to work. I think you can encourage it, but then also create an environment where they want to come back to work and work with their peers. And that's what we're seeing now. You see in the yeah, same. It was, it was in, yeah. You know, we are, it was really interesting. I had, I had um, probably one of my direct parts. I had one person who was very, um, very remote, uh, focus thought that the team was more productive and that we should go fully remote. And and we never did, you know, we have a whole bunch of roles here that, you know, people have to be in, you know, with their hands on, just think of, uh, you know, titles and plates, you know, people aren't taking titles to cars home or, or they aren't, you know, doing the DMV at home. So we had people in, and then we, as we slowly brought people back, but it was interesting, the company's biggest advocate for let's go remote. I still remember this First, first week back, stopped by my office three days. He said, remember everything that I said about remote being better? It's not true. And I, I, I said, whoa, whoa, come on in. We're going to have a conversation. He said, walk me through. He goes, there's just a certain amount of drop-ins. There's just a certain amount of hallway talk that I underestimated the value of it. And, and so, you know, we, we have what we call a level up program, level one through five. Level five, you can be remote five days a week. So think of a, a salesperson, they might be remote. Um, and then, you know, uh, level one is, you know, one day. Uh, but here's what's interesting. You know, I, I, one of the things I enjoy doing is, is talking to young leaders and or people that are in, emerging. And, you know, we run an intern program and I always try to give them some, some face time during that. And I think the population that's really got to think through remote and hybrid, maybe the most, is people younger in their career. You know, uh, the first day I started in my career, our president came in and said, you know, hey, the best person doesn't get the job. And at first I sat there like, whoa, I joined the wrong company. And he said, the best known person gets the job. Make sure we know who you are. And what what sage advice to get on the first day of your career. And when you're remote, it, it's it's tough for people to know you. You know, they, they know you professionally, but they just don't know you. Also, the amount of things that just you learn. I, I look back at some of the, I think, good habits I have at how to how to run a meeting, how to attend a meeting, how to listen. I think I learned from senior people when I was emerging leader by watching them. And there's just a certain amount of that. You know, it's sort of like, you know, driving an F1 car. You can be best on the simulator, but there's no replacement for being on the track. Yeah. And I think you you can be great on Zoom, but there's just no replacement for, you know, being on site and just seeing, hey, this is how a company runs. And so, you know, I encourage all young leaders out there, hey, if your boss, if your manager says, hey, you don't need to come in or you need to come in one day a week, take that as a suggestion. Come in more often 
And I think you'll find that you'll really learn more, you'll advance more, and you'll progress more just from being around really good people and good leaders. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that um, I've had for now 15 years is an advisory board. And, you know, that advisory board, I've always been uh, envious of the experience that uh, people have, because I think so much of learning is, is experience. And so I've had an advisory board for 15 plus years, different people that rotate in, in and off on different skill sets. Some are sales, some are operational, some are HR. So, you know, they're, they're from all over the world from different types of businesses and, and really it's so I can learn from them and, and, you know, learn by their mistakes. Uh, so I, I don't repeat them or minimize uh, my learnings. And so it's about taking their experience and uh, leaning into them. So I think any young leader, what, no matter how good you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how hardworking you are, the only way you get experience is by being there doing that. And if you're a young leader, I always looked at how can you accelerate experience, right? If you're a 25 year old, how do you get the experience of a 35 year old, 45 year old, 55 year old? It's have some of those people around you. Otherwise you're not going to know what happens when you're 26 until you hit 26. Uh, and, and so much of what I've learned over the years are, uh, what to do and what not to do, as you said, you know, when to speak up in a meeting, when not to speak up in a meeting. I think when you're younger, you're more likely to always be on uh, the gas. And I think, you know, you learn over time when to be on the gas, when to hit the brake and when to, and when to coast. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so I had a question. You talked about advisory boards. Um, as I've gotten to watch McLaren expand, cause I think a lot of people see McLaren racing as the formula one, but you've, we've moved into other, other formats, extreme E uh, you've moved into formula E you clearly have a vision, you know, can you, can you give lessons learned for, uh, audience people out there that are, they're trying to craft a vision for their, for their company, their team themselves, maybe just personally and professionally, but you clearly, one of your skill sets is seeing the bigger picture, seeing where the market's going, being able to craft something that then people are excited to follow. So can you just give us maybe some lessons learned on building a, building a vision? Yeah, it was interesting when I joined McLaren, um, kind of my vision was to bring it back to really kind of what it once was in the more modern era. And what I mean by that is when I grew up, McLaren was a Formula One team, but they had won the 8500. I remember how exciting it was when they went to Le Mans and won on their debut. And McLaren was like this Formula One team that anything else it raced in it, it, it won. And it was also always the innovator in what a Formula One team should look like. And when I joined, the team was ninth in the championship. They were back to being just a Formula One team. They no longer had IndyCar, Can-Am, which was an older series. They made Formula 5,000 cars. And it was like, I want to get McLaren back to what it once was, which is this world championship, all conquering racing team that gets fans and partners excited when they enter other forms of motorsport. And then to continue to lead the charge and where, you know, leading the charge 20, 30 years ago was the new motorhomes, the new trucks, the, the look and feel of the technology Today, it's about digital and fan engagement, but same principle, which is leading. And so when I joined, it was, you know, let's fix the Formula One team. And we're still on that journey. But, you know, we won our first race in 10 years and had a one, two and first podium in five, six years. So we're on our way. Then we acquired an IndyCar team. And that was because North America is so important to our sponsors and to our fans. So it was about expanding our, our, our offering, if you'd like, to our fans and our partners. Then we acquired, well, we started an Extreme E team, as you know, and that's where uh, we, we've, we've partnered. And that was all around 
sustainability and DE&I, which is also very important to McLaren, which I want to come back to here in a second and ask you about, because I know how important it is to, to, to you and your organization. And then because that was very successful in a short period of time, we acquired the uh, championship Formula E team to kind of double down on sustainability. And so kind of the vision was being, we're a racing team, so we're in the business of, of racing. It was expanding our footprint to serve our partners and our fans in racing series that shared our core values, North America, sustainability, DE&I. We have our first female uh, McLaren racing driver in, in Emma Gilmore. And so for me, it was kind of bringing the brand back to what it once was, was, was my vision and was laying that out. And we're, um, we're headed that direction. I'd be curious because sustainability is, you know, a relatively new topic. And I know it's at the heart of your value system. How did you bring that in to your organization? Because, you know, we've brought it into ours, but you have people that have varying degrees of understanding of what sustainability means. They have uh, various levels of understanding of how they can contribute and others, you know, why should we do it? I presume you had all those same challenges. How did you tackle that inside the organization? Yeah. So, you know, we, we look at sustainability from what's called the broader ESG strategy, um, environmental, social, and governance. And, and I'll kind of walk through how, how we got there. And, you know, the first way we got there is, you know, our vision is enable the movement of people, goods, and services freely. And, and it's great vision. It really is good for the company. And we said, we're going to add on and responsibly. And when we did that, you know, as a commercial fleet company three years ago, we were about a billion dollars and we made, we, we made the uh, reservations for 40,000 electric vehicles, two and a half billion dollars worth. We just said, we saw that, Hey, the future is going to be electric and lots of people say they want to be ESG, but how do you make those commitments? So we went out and we procured and reserved 40,000 electric vehicles, mostly cargo vans and pickups for our clients, which really gave us some a, a lot of um, status out in front of not just saying we want it to be in an in in EV electric focused on the environment type of company, but it really was credible. The second thing that we did is uh, we actually partnered with you on your Extreme E. And what got us jazzed about Extreme E um, wasn't being able to bring fans to the races because you can't. You can't really bring fans to the races. It was the gender equality was the first thing that hit having a male and female driver. You know, when I first got to Merchants, we had uh, 10 people on the leadership team and they were all male. Uh, we now have five females, five um, males. And what's interesting is we're in an industry that's about 82% male oriented as I, I don't know what your numbers are in racing, but I, it might even be greater than 82%. Not, not far off that. Depends what part yeah. of the racing team, but you can imagine, you know, in the racing team itself, it skews very, uh, very male. So here's what's really interesting. So we did that four years ago and now four years later, we're 51% female, 49% male. But I think that's, I say I think, cause you know, I haven't done the research on it. I'm not sure you, you can do research on it. We have a lot of women that will pick us over maybe our competitors cause they, cause they look up the organizational chart and they say, that can be me. They can identify with somebody. So that's kind of that, that um, you know, S part of e, um, ESG, the D, E, and I. But, but um, one thing that I learned with our partnership, uh, when, when you did your launch in the UK um, with Prince Charles, who's actually been promoted since to, uh, to King, yeah. um, uh, one thing that struck me is I, I, after we, we unveiled the Extreme E-Car, you unveiled it, and I got to see... Uh, there was a big protest in Glasgow and it was all, and I walked down to it and it was pretty emotional, very low EQ, by the way, very low EQ with protesters. And it was all about greenwashing. And I remember coming, going back to my hotel room and writing my leadership team a very long note on if we are going to say we're an ESG company, we really have to do it. I just saw the downside of putting out press releases and not honoring your commitments so the third thing that we did is we said, you know, do we really know what ESG is as a company? 
So everybody at director and above went through a Harvard sustainability course. Uh, and, and at the time, I thought that was going to be okay. I didn't know if it was going to be great. One of the best things we did, because a lot of people came out of that, very focused on sustainability is more than electric vehicles. Because some people thought, oh, we're a commercial fleet company, put more electric vehicles. They really understood it. it's about governance. It's about sustainability. It's about doing good. And, and that exceeded my expectations. So sustainability is really important to us. Uh, but then, you know, what I learned out of that COP26 over in Glasgow is you have to every day be saying, what more can we do? To follow that, and and I know uh, when I when I brought my my team over to the McLaren Tech Center in December, it was I think the week after Emma had won uh, a podium for for your extreme e first, and she was the first female racer for McLaren's history to to win a race, and her trophy was there, and, and I got to hold it, and and you know there's a little magic to that, just getting to 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 touch that and. And, and uh, by the way, when Emma was out at our fleet summit, we had about 300 customers and, and people in. Um, what a shining beacon for for women. Um, obviously, you hire her for multiple reasons. One is, can she drive fast? But just the role model she is for so many women out there. And you know, her talk was at nine in the morning. It ended at 930 and she could have taken off and she was here at 10 that night. So just a real testament to her commitment um, to, to McLaren, to your partners, but, you know, uh, coming back to ESG, it's, it's something that's very important to, to us, uh, very important to us as a company, but more important, it's something that we have to honor very similar to values. You've got to honor them every day by doing what you said you're going to do. Uh, how about, I mean, you've been recently acquired, right? So now you've got your values, your leadership team that you've you've built and you've, you've kind of reshaped merchants. What happens now? I've sold my company before and bought and sold. And the first thing is employees are, uh Oh, what's going to, what's going to change. And typically, unfortunately, most think of it as a, as kind of, maybe it's a concern. It's a bit of a negative as opposed to a pot, you know, no, no, you know, this is going to be great. We're going to be even better. It's going to be, uh Oh, what changes? So you've got your values that you've you've driven into the organization. How have you communicated to your 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 team? What 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 are the ground rules with your new owners on? Hey, this is what our company stands for, and kind of how we roll. Don't mess that up. Yeah. So it's uh, it's real interesting, and, and I'd say the answer starts with before you excuse me, before you go into the sales process, what are your goals coming out of it? So one of our goals is, you know, we've been, we've been growing really well as a company. Um, we talk about enjoying the journey and we didn't want our journey to come to an end. And in our industry, a number of companies have kind of come together and merged to become one, one stronger company. There's been some consolidations. Uh, our leadership team, we kind of said, we want to keep the party going. We think we're doing a pretty good job. We think we've built a special culture. We think we have a vision. We think we have an ESG strategy. We think uh, we're empowering um, you know, women and diversity in our company the way some of our competitors aren't. And we want to keep that going. So we went to our current owners at the time and said, hey, when, as, when we go to market and we go to look at an exit, could we not bring in any of our competitors or any merger opportunities? We want to. We don't want to be acquired and then folded in. We want to be our standalone and keep doing and have the opportunity to keep doing what we're doing. So the first um, setup, if you will, ground rules before you even hire the banker and you go to market is aligning with whoever owns you currently to make sure that you come out the other side where you think is best for the company. So we got that agreement from our current ownership or our previous ownership, and we thank them for that. Then as we went through the process and as we we had you know various options to look at. We really looked at who is going to help propel us where we want to go, as opposed to who are we going to serve as a platform to go where they want to go. And at the time, Bain Capital had a small investment in the company. So they got to, and by the way, they came in on March 13th, 2020, uh, the week COVID was really breaking out. You know, as they say, they, they were home uh, when the deal closed um, and they had a chance to see us for a couple of years. So they liked what they saw. We brought in the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. 
um, Adia and their general thesis. And, and we had a, a roundtable at our fleet summit. It was the first question our clients asked, you know, what can we expect as new owners? What changes can we expect? And with the, with the ownership we got and then the leadership team, you know, we bought a stake in the company. So we have uh, skin in the game. They said, we don't want changes. We want merchants to keep doing what it's doing. And I think that's very important in terms of knowing what you want up front before you go into the process. Um, I've actually been through the process four times. And what I tell everybody is if you aren't clear on what you want to get after it's over, you're not, you're not going to get it. Whether that's, you know, the value of your company. Um, you know, I've had friends sell companies. They've sold them to big companies. And two years later, they're disappointed that their brand got eroded and is gone. But yet as an outsider, I could kind of look and say, did you think that Fortune 100 was going to not make any change? I think that's naive. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of knowing what you're going to do going in and then honoring that throughout the process. And, and everyone's going to try to take different angles, but then staying focused, staying really, really focused. And I think when, when I look at leaders in this company and other companies I work with, the leaders that are really successful have a vision, they have a set of values, and they really let them guide their decisions on a daily basis. Um, and in this case, on a strategic basis and in, in, in the sale of a company. So, uh, so it's, 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 you know, we're, we're four months in, five months in, just had a board meeting. And, you know, of course you do idea generation, you come up with all these new ideas of, of sexy new things you can do. And, and I kind of said, Hey guys, I, I think those are great, but not now. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. And their answer back was absolutely, you're right. You're right. Hey, we're just thinking outside the box, but we've got a good thing going. Let's continue to go where we're, we're going. So, you know, really, um, really in, important to, to know that on the front end, because if you don't, then you might find out too late in the process. So uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking that. It's, um, it's, it's, it's interesting going through the process. Um, you know, last year was, was a great, uh, band year for our company. It was our 60th anniversary last year. And this year, McLaren's Ours. 60th anniversary. We're getting you know, I think together. this past weekend, I think this past weekend, you just had a, a, well, a we, big party. We, we rolled out our, our new race car and our, our plans. So we'll be, uh, it'll be like Disneyland. We're going to have a birthday all year long. Um, our, our actual birthday is, I think it's September 2nd, if I'm not, uh, mistaken. And, uh, but it should be a fun, fun year celebrating our history while trying to make, uh, new, new history. But, you know, like you, we're kind of grounded in, uh, a handful of pillars that are, you know, critically important to our value system. And these are not in any one particular order because they're all, equally as important but we're trying to be the the best place and sports team to to work uh right so we want to have a highly motivated uh workforce and you know take care of them and keep them motivated and you know everyone kind of different things work for different different people uh our, our corporate partners our sponsors they're the lifeblood of our our business and so our job is to build their business in w whatever their goals are and there's a lot of similarities amongst our partners and what they want to do and there's a lot of things they want to do different depending on what where they are in the stage of of their business and are they consumer are they b2b are they both etc um then uh, our fans because without our fans we wouldn't have any sponsors and without any sponsors we wouldn't have a a race team so really taking care of of our fans and we do that through you know engagement and inclusivity and making them feel part of the team and then last but definitely not least is sustainability and as you said esg it means a lot of different things to a lot of people most people especially in the automotive industry kind of default to what we call the power unit the engine but there's fiscal responsibility there's climate there's emissions, there's mental health, there's safety. So there's so many different um, elements that sit under an ESG program and they're all important. And so we want to make sure that we work closely with our partners like, like you, um, that our, our workforce have an opportunity to, to um, play a role. Uh, and then also we're on the cutting edge of technology. So we work with a lot of our partners and governments on 
how can we take our knowledge and know-how that we we get on this cutting edge technology in Formula One and deploy it through other businesses? So we work with some of our sponsors on aerodynamics so they can keep, I'm just going to sound crazy, keep ice cream frozen longer so it doesn't end up on the factory floor. And we know that because we know how aerodynamics works. And so, you know, not only do we have um, uh, the obligation to entertain fans, we want to make the world a better place. And so th that's our kind of value system that, you know, our, and, and everything's critically important. And um, it's a lot of fun doing it, you know, entertaining people and uh, contributing to making the world a better place. Now, one thing I wanted to circle back with is, you know, we kind of kicked this off talking a little bit about passion. And, you know, uh, one thing that people may not know about you is you're still a driver. You're, you're still out there while. driving. Uh, and, you know, you and I believe one of your, you know, uh, mates from when you were younger um, own a company, United Autosports, that's, uh, you know, one of the UK's fastest growing motorsports, world endurance championships. Uh, and, and you drive in some of these races. Um, can you tell me a little bit more you know, about that? It's, um, it's my form of relaxation is uh, if I have a weekend off from going to a race, I go to a race. Um, <laughs> you know, I raced professionally for 10 years and I absolutely love it. And I love the history of the sport. And I've been fortunate um, when I sold my company to uh, be able to invest in some uh, some historic cars. And so I love to get out and drive. It, it kind of reminds me of why I'm in the sport. I, I kind of driving these older cars and I'm talking 1980s, 1990s, not 1930s, but cars that I grew up watching brings back my, my childhood. And uh, I don't know, I think as you get uh, older, at least certainly me, I don't know if this is how you feel, you look back and like, I miss Little League Baseball uh, at the time you know, it's what you do as a kid. And I, I've, I've got um, a good friend whose kid's a, a, a great baseball player in Little League. And it's like, tell Jack to enjoy Little League because he'll look back and in 30 years, 40 years, wish he was playing Little League again. So I do like fantasy baseball camps. So uh, racing for me and some of that stuff is about keeping my youthfulness uh, going and, and, you know, coming back to my passion for the sport, it kind of keeps that uh, ignited. Do you, do you share that? Do you have look back at oh. some of the things you did when you were 15 and might be a little bit harder to do them now, but you, you'd love to do it again? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've always enjoyed cars. I've always been a, a, a car guy. And um, I know I'm coming up to uh, United's race uh, in Sebring. And so I've always liked being around cars. And what, what's funny is um, kind of without a, a necess necessarily a design, you know, careers aren't straight lines. You know, they kind of look like um, EKG diagrams a little bit, a lot more than maybe what a 20 year old thinks. It's just up, 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 um, you know, and I've enjoyed, you know, becoming a, a partner with you at United Autosports because that fuels one of my passions. You know, it, it's, it's like I really enjoy going to the races as a partner, getting a chance to go to a race as an owner. Um, I've never been a professional racer, so I am not going to volunteer to get behind the wheel, uh, <laughs> during an actual race. Um, now but know, we'll get you behind the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just make sure just, just don't, don't have it be too crowded out there or have great insurance either, <laughs> either, either or. or, but I, yeah. So, so I look back, you know, oftentimes and, you know, I have an 18 year old and 20 year old and, and, um, you actually had a chance to meet him. Matter of fact, uh, I, I brought my, to the my shop. family over. Yeah, my, my daughter's in, in, in Scotland. So we flew over to have American Thanksgiving in Scotland and we came out to visit you at, at United Auto. And I did have to explain to my son that Thanksgiving is not a holiday globally. Um, it is more of a U.S. holiday. And, and it was interesting, um, like my kids got to see a side of me. And this was really interesting. I didn't share this with you, but, you know, we're flying back uh, to Scotland after the after spending Thanksgiving with you out at United Auto, looking at your collection, walking around the shop floor and my son and daughter turned to me and go, you were like 10 years old today. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, you had so much fun. And that, that's, that's, the, that's the passion. That's the energy, getting back to do things. And, and um, I think I saw on social media, St. Louis Cardinals. Is, yeah, is that the, so. the home team, uh, fantasy camp? Hey, so now, you know, for, for the people listening out there that are, that are maybe, you know, 
still younger. They're in their 20s. They're 25. What advice would you give to Zach Brown 25 years? If, if you were 25 today and you know what you know, so earlier you talked about when you're 25, you have the experience of a 25. When you're 26, what advice would you give your 25-year-old self today? Um, the biggest thing that I've worked on over the years that I'm a lot better at is tackling um, issues, problems, confrontation, call it what you want, right? There's various degrees. Confrontation might be a nine or a 10 and little problems, uh, one or two. What I found is they don't go away and you kind of, you can hope they go away. You can wish they go away. But I, I over the years, um, I've made problems worse by not tackling them sooner because I, I, they, they felt too sticky or, you know, the confrontational is probably the wrong word, uncomfortable. And, hey, that's what you got to do as a, a leader. Not everything, to your point, it's a bit of an EKG. And I think early on it was like, ah, I don't want to deal with that issue. That's just uncomfortable for me. And what I found is I, I had to deal with it, and it was more difficult to deal with it as time went by. So I think that would be – Number one for for me, I was fortunate that I did get uh, mentors very early on. So I would I would tell myself to do that again. But I think the one that I've I've gotten a lot better at over time was was tackling uh, issues because that's what everyone looks at you to do when you're the whether you're the ultimate leader of the business or a leader of a division. If you are a leader, you got to take the tough decisions. You got to tackle the tough subject sometimes. It's not always fun. It's not always comfortable. But if you don't, the problem will tackle you in a, in a bigger way. So I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned uh, over the years and what, what I think was a weakness of mine. Still have plenty of weaknesses, but that was one that um, – and it was just because I was actually just kind of scared to tackle the the – the topic to have the difficult conversation and uh but it was worse if i waited how about you yeah uh, you know for me like an analogy sometimes i use is you know if, if like water's coming down a mountain it finds other water is you know leaders find other leaders and and i think the advice i'd give myself or anyone 25 is you know believe in the leadership in yourself believe in the leader in yourself but go find the best leader and maybe the most challenging leader you can work for and work for them. Cause you know, when you work for really good people um, to your point, they may make you uncomfortable at times because they're pushing you to do things that are beyond your limits, but that's exactly what, what a good leader does. Um, a good leader, you know, says, Hey, you can climb 10,000 feet when you only think you had 8,000 in you. And then they push you to 15,000 and 20,000, whatever, whatever, you know, analogy you want to use there. But I look back at when I grew the most in my career, I can directly tie it to, I worked for leaders that um, some people might've thought were tough. Um, I never thought they were tough, uh, maybe tough, but fair. I viewed that they just pushed me to bring out the absolute best in me. And at times they saw things in me, I didn't see it myself. You know, they saw, um, you know, wisdom that I hadn't earned. They saw passion. And, and I remember a couple of times being like, I don't know why this person trusts me so much, but they do. So I would tell folks, go find the best leaders, the most challenging leaders and work for them. Even if that means, you know, changing your role in a company or going to work, uh, taking a lateral move to work for somebody that you say, geez, I want to be like them. And that gets to that mentoring part, which is have mentors. I've been fortunate. I've had five mentors in my career um, and everyone has helped me at different stages of my career. Now, my early mentors kind of kept me out of trouble. Um, you know, I, I'd call them up, say, I need to have a meeting and I'm seeing red. You know, I'm right, they're wrong. And they're, then by the end of, you know, an hour later, it was like, okay, maybe I'm not right. Maybe they're not wrong. And, you know, they just had wisdom I didn't. And then, you know, as I got later in my career, you know, mentors became more sounding boards, like your advisory board you talked about, than maybe keeping me out of trouble. Maybe they just helped guide me. And oftentimes at the end of a mentor session, I'd say, thanks. And you're like, Brennan, I didn't do any talking. I asked a couple of questions and you talked, but they knew the questions to ask. They, yeah. I, I was looking at the tactical and they were looking at the strategic. So I would say, believe in yourself, 
uh, work for the, the most challenging and demanding people you can. That's how you grow and, and have mentors. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Well, good advice. Yeah. Hey, Zach, this has been great, but uh, I think we got to get back to uh, to work. What do you think? Yeah, the phone's probably been uh, been ringing, but I can make up for some lost time. But it's been a great chat. We should do it again. Absolutely. Hey, great chatting with you. Thanks for uh, partnering uh, with Merchants. Thanks for partnering with me. Um, I enjoy uh, learning from you, and I'm also looking forward to uh, Season 5 coming up it, in another week. It's going to be good. Week. It comes out in a, uh, a couple weeks, and I'm looking forward to... Uh, going racing with you. It's going to be great, and uh, you're going to love Sebring. Take care. Good seeing you. You too. See you later. This has been Fast and Fearless with Zach Brown and Brendan P. Keegan. Follow Zach on Twitter and Instagram at ZBrownCEO. And connect with Brendan on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at BPK Fearless. Fast and Fearless is a production of Forbes Books.